Good morning, fellow plant breeders and plant scientists all over the world. Hey, this is Dave, David Benson with Cornhusker Hybrids LLC in Lincoln, Nebraska, where our trademark and mantra is success starts with the seed. No truer words have ever been spoken in this business. In the past and in the and continuing till this day, whole civilizations and economies and world economies and country economies have risen and fallen based essentially on the power of the genetics in their seed. So today I'm going to focus again on the, my favorite genetic gain equation, which we're going to work a lot in one of my most favorite variables of all time, which is genotype by environment interaction. I even was so interested in genotype by environment interaction back when I was in graduate school that I actually did a seminar that I didn't have to just on that topic. It's always been tremendous interest to me. It is the number one impediment to progress in plant breeding because some crops, the one I work with, maize, has tremendous interactions with the environment. It's just unbelievable what, what can happen. So today we're going to talk about the genotype by environment interaction portion of the genetic gain formula. And if you, this to me is the, is the breeder's Bible. If you don't know this by heart and don't practice it in your program or your company's programs, you really ought to ask why you're not. Now, you, you cut to the chase today we're going to talk about in the phenotypic variance component of the model, the genotype by environment interaction component, which is essentially genotypes by environments divided by the genotypes and the variance that arises thereof. Now, nothing simple in plant breeding, right? Everything's simple and nothing is simple. So, if you can follow with this simple schematics that I have, where I just have two genotypes and two environments and, and discuss the two major type of interactions you can have between any two genotypes in any two environments. So essentially, in the top one, in this classic sense, we have environments along the bottom and, and genotypes going up and down here and uh, you can see that genotype 1 and genotype 2 they have a certain distance between them that's kind of maintained and we'll just call that you know our starting point or one one environment well what can happen then if you go into environment 2 between those two genotypes because I can tell you they will never be exactly the same that's just not going to happen and this is just two genotypes. This is not exploring all the other genotypes in your test or all your environments that you're testing. This is just looking at the basic, simplest thing you can look at, two genotypes and two environments, right? Well, you can either have the classic change in magnitude or you can have the classic change in rank. Now, which one is the worst? Well, you would have to say it's a change in rank gives you the most problems. But that's not necessarily always true either if you know the reason. But, so you get the magnitude change and you just see that genotype 2 has changed its performance in, in uh, environments 1 and 2. And it's different. It's better. It ends up better. It's not as good in 1 and better in 2 than it was before. Okay? That's a change in magnitude. If you're just looking at two hybrids, let's say in maize, and I'll use my, uh, let's just use MT per hectare since most people know that. Uh, maybe in environment one, it was two MT, and environment two, it was six MT, and the last time it was three and four, let's just say. And, and also in my instance here, one changes also. So that's a change in magnitude. And so if you think about a big test, and I used to test uh, 60 entries, it was pretty common for me, and when I'm doing a large amount of uh, breeding, and I would have 54, 56 entries and four checks that I knew a lot about, and that's the way I run the program uh, 
for, for the amount of time. And so just think about that, what happens. So when you get a lot of entries and a lot of interaction. And so then, but then you look at the classic change in rank where in environment two, genotype two was better, but in environment, excuse me, in environment one, genotype two was better. But in environment two, genotype two did not perform near as well. And we had an absolute point of crossover change in rank. Now this, you just cannot have in your best cultivars. They just cannot be that way. You have to weed those out. And early on, there may be a lot of that, even when you have a limited number of locations. So if you think about this in the most simplistic uh, way in your own experiments, you have literally, so if you just had 30 entries and four environments, you have 120 data points. And so you have all of those possible interac interactions between those genotypes uh, within that data set. And of course you can plot them all out and regress every one of them and put a slope on them and all that. But normally what we do, especially early on, is we eliminate the ones at the bottom. But you want to look for your most stable entries. And I think that's something that people don't do enough of. I mean, I still, and was very big on, I would test, I would always test my environments to the same ratio. We had the possibility to do, to do managed stress environments where we could irrigate to high potential and withhold water. And I had that at a number of locations, so I worked that at every location. So we were promoting genotype by environment interaction and trying to see which genotypes were the most stable dependent based on the water variable, as long as the environment would work with us. And so um, what happens is you can, I used to take in, in, in my, uh, we get a GCA report or however you want to express your data and see how these, all these variables, how these hybrids did, not just in across the test, but I also wanted to know what their mean was across the high, in our managed stress environments, the high stress location, part of the test and the more we provide all the water. We make it a lucrative uh, growing environment, uh, excellent for the plants. And the other part, we're really stressing them. And we can do that actually if we don't get water in Nebraska. It's not that hard and you can run pretty good tests that way most years. But so what happens is you look at those all and you divide those up that way and then you look at however you want to look at them, how they rank, but how stable they are. And so back in the day when we were, I was using GCA reports, I can tell you that the best genotypes would be about 108% of the mean in the high yield part of the managed stress environment. And they would need to be at least 102 or 103% of the mean in the tougher end of the environment, the rain, the dry land portion of the test, the withholding of water. And if anything, anywhere was less than 100% of the mean in either regime or overall, it never got advanced. Let me say that never got advanced. And they had to be over the mean in both normally by two or three percent for me to advance them. And so when you started doing that, you had a short list of advancers and you also had a tremendous amount of interaction in your uh, mean squares. So today, I just wanna leave it with you to think about genetic gain and think about genotype by environment. It's huge in the crop I work with. I mean, it's the biggest, Next to the ear effect, it's absolutely the biggest impediment to genetic progress because it yanks you all over the place. And we'll talk about some of those uh, personal uh, 
issues with genotype by environment interaction, you want to call that I've had to overcome or had to really, it's really thrown wrenches in my plan. But remember, anytime you're comparing any two genotypes across two environments, if you just simplify that, they're not going to perform exactly the same. So at the very least, there's going to be some change in a uh, change of magnitude. And if you're getting a change in rank, then you really need to look at your locations or see what happened, uh, why that is. Uh, a lot of times it can just be lousy genetics, throw it away, discard it. But so I want you to think about that. But I also want you to think about improving the rate of genetic gain as your number one priority in your breeding program. And that, that, that genetic gain equation becomes your Bible to how you're going to develop products and also how you're going to determine if you're making genetic gain. So when I say that the world's population has increased from two and a half billion to seven and a half billion from 1950 to 2020, that is a 300% increase in 70 years, about 4.3% a year if you look at it that way. Now somehow, some way, we're not really keeping up with it, but it hasn't buried the plant breeders yet. The world population hasn't. But 2050, they're predicting 9 billion, 9 billion plus, which is a really big number. And that's about a 360% increase from 1950 in 100 years. Think of that. So we've got to get on the genetic gain. We've got to develop products that do the things that we need them to do, which is produce more food and fiber or grain yield in my case. And if we can do it by protecting the soil and conserving water and do this all more efficiently, that makes the whole thing work better. So in order to feed these people and nourish them adequately, we gotta get off our hands and get off our butts and get to work and there's a lot of work to do. So I encourage you all to make improving the rate of genetic gain the number one goal in your business life. It is in mine, and I work diligently in different places in the world to try to help with that. So again, this is David Benson with Cornhusker Hybrids LLC in Lincoln, Nebraska, where our mantra and motto, motto is, success starts with a seed. Go out, have fun harvesting or planting, depending on where in the world you are. Enjoy your job, and let's, let's increase the rate of genetic gain, and let's make it a priority. We'll talk to you next week.